I came into this area of micromagnetics unburdened by any background information <laughs> and actually uh, that may be a good valuable thing because I was unburdened also by any previous wisdom. <laughs> CEA around 1982 got a hold of uh, two colleagues of mine and wanted to uh, find out if could anybody get from start to finish in an empty building and put together a system or systems to make thin film media. <coughs> and that was the commission that we started off with. It's a modest amount of money. It was under a million, under half a million dollars. And the very first machine that I got a hold of myself was a scanning electron microscope, which I used to improve on plating, on polishing, and on doing some studies of the finished material that we were making. At that time, nobody had for sale any equipment that you would call miniaturized stuff. We had to build everything ourselves, and the company began in October of 1982. For a few months, there was mostly a little bit of paper pushing, organization, lawyers running back and forth, and we ran around also looking for places to put the company. Finally ended up on Palomar Avenue in Sunnyvale. Empty building completely. There were uh, three of us that began. At no time were there more than 10 people, two of which were secretaries, that the others were like a technician in plating and a technician in sputtering. Powell put together a nice system based on uh, a cross glass of a system, glass uh, <coughs> tubing that is pretty standard in vacuum equipment. We only plated, uh, sputtered on one side only, and I did the, um, the plating, the electrolyzed nickel. At the time, I was desperate to find a tank system that would be small enough to uh, work with but there was absolutely nothing available out there. There were companies around like on, on off of uh, Highway 17 near O'Toole that put together plastic systems, but they had nothing small. One day I spied two of their demonstration systems that were sitting in a corner that they took to trade fairs. So I had them link the two together. One side was brown, the other side was blue. That didn't bother us, and that became the, the plating system. Then there had to be cleaning of uh, the wastewater, which was monitored very closely by the city. And then uh, between the three of us and the technicians, we managed to work <coughs> to get plated media on both sides, nickel, polished very nicely. To do the polishing, I got a hold of a Strasbaugh machine, and uh, there was no weights for this available. There was no pressure platen on the top. So I got at Orchard Supply a bunch of fishing weights and lead and melted those personally with a, a torch and a, and a little bit of a holder and put that into uh, a bunt pans, actually. It had a hole in the middle. And uh, that served, you had to put them on one at a time to build up the, uh, and it went incrementally, of course. But it turns out you don't get a good polishing until you have a certain pressure pushing down on the, uh, on the actual cloth. Anyway, that uh, was checked out by scanning electron microscopy as well to find out what the pressure should be, particle size, uh, when it was happening, what was the best kind of aluminum oxide to use, on and on and on. Along in these lines, there was other things that went on that bringing in a uh, MH uh, loop tester, which was about a two-ton magnet, which took three uh, forklift trucks because the first two tipped over. It was just too heavy for them. This had to be pushed into its final position like an elephant pushing a log along into the room. But anyway, all of that came about and we worked hard. We started that, uh, opened that door on the 3rd of January of 1983. And the very first disc was made, finished disc, was made sometime in about um, April or May. And we kept going, and about every two days we'd have a finished product, which I personally would run up to Scotts Valley and turn it in at the desk, and they would do measurements on that uh, overnight and come back with 
characteristics of the magnetic material, which was cobalt chromium, just plain cobalt with 20% chromium. Along the way, uh, it was necessary to demonstrate that this was going to be a corrosion resistant material, because as we've heard tonight, corrosion has always been and has been a key pro problem and a topic always being discussed. So for that purpose, being an electrochemist and a metallurgist, I took a filter paper and a power supply, put some right kind of solution in the filter paper and said, well, the humidity is 100% right here, it's wet, and put a carbon uh, cathode on top of that, a little sandwich, pass current, and in about five minutes you could tell which disc was going to dissolve and which one wouldn't. So it was a very high okay. speed test. You didn't have to wait six months, 12 months, two months, <laughs> anything. Mm -hmm. And of course, cobalt chromium <coughs> at 20% chromium is a good candidate because it's also good jet engine material, jet engine blade material. It's highly corrosion resistant. <coughs> so we passed the test very beautifully and we proceeded onward from there. Then in June 6th, we produced one of the discs, sent it up, I took it up to uh, Scotts Valley. I got a reading the next day that it had exceeded all expectations, that it had three times the expected linear density. And this was all uh, exciting to everybody. And so I asked Gordon Hughes, who was at Seagate at the time, to send us a report, which we put into the request for further funding. And that disc is now known as the $9 million disc because it generated, actually not nine, but 8.875 million for the second round of financing. But there's a mystery connected with that because although it worked very, very well, we went back into the laboratory and tried to duplicate that and tried very hard to duplicate that. <laughs> and to uh, our chagrin is, and to everybody's chagrin, it did not work. It did not duplicate. So we went through all the, light, all the background information that we had, of what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong. And uh, it turns out the vacuum guy, Powell, wrote his notebook in what I call high-speed block printing. It sort of looked like a cuneiform on the original Assyrian tablets. <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time trying to decipher those, of what had gone right, what had gone wrong. And uh, at some point, we just <coughs> gave up on the whole idea, and it became longitudinal media that we were making. You were doing perpendicular before that, though, right? Well, there's a mystery that was finally solved, partially anyway, of what had actually happened. And I found this out only by from talking to one of the technicians much, much later, that on the night that they had made those measurements, they had run out of heads. They had run out of up heads. So they used a down head. <laughs> However, as you know, with a down head, if you push on that, you're going to gouge the disc up. It was much later than that when I was a VP at, at DASTEC making heads. I realized that when they, the ladies who package it have a little vibrating diamond tape that they give them a little touch before they package them. So it's entirely possible to put a uh, leading edge on the, on the storage part of the head and it makes it fly one time. But I haven't got the whole story straight on that. So the $9 million disc may actually be the oddball head, but it's certainly got everybody going. It's a <coughs> company startup. You can say it was a shaky platform to develop any kind of further work on that. And nevertheless, everybody persevered, and we're back down where we are now. <coughs> and I must say, after listening to Tu Chen tonight and to Tanya Mashta, that uh, my education has, in the area of magnetics has improved a little bit more. Thank you very much. <laughs>